let's just go ahead and go to that slide with our sponsor. Okay, hold on one second. I got to get the live going. <laughs> oh. Unfortunately, it's one of those things where I have to I have to interrupt our presentation to do it. It's okay. I have got it recording. I'll just do it in a second. So our sponsor. All right. So Benasinga with Allstate. Um, you know, Allstate is one of our premier platinum sponsors, and they have been so tremendous uh, throughout the last several years. And um, what I was going to just say to Ben is uh, I, tra I switched over to Allstate uh, the end of last year, or maybe it was last summer. Last year, I switched over. I had been a USA um, person for 20 years and moved over to Allstate because I couldn't beat the rate. And then uh, last month, I got my payback for being, it's not being a good driver, but it's just for the pandemic and not driving as much and all that. So I was just going to say thank you to Ben for that. Uh, but we will just say thank you for all that you do to support our office. We really appreciate it. All right, so here we are, Tuesday, May 19th, and hey, Stace. Um, okay, so what I wanted to talk about today is uh, the reopening of our office, uh, because I, I just want to make sure you guys are really clear on what we're trying to achieve here. Um, I was just so excited to get all of our staff back and, uh, and, and start getting some... Um, I don't know, some normalcy, I guess, if you will. So, but I, I put it together a little prepared to open the office and I'm just gonna read it to you, okay? Uh, the, the city and state government agencies are opening back up in phases. Even though we've been considered an essential infrastructure throughout the shelter in place orders, we're still suggesting that you use care and caution on all of your real estate showings open houses, inspections, appraisals, etc. The government offices are encouraging those facing back or have been working as an essential infrastructure to still do the following. Quarantine yourself if you're starting to feel sick or experiencing any of the symptoms. Quarantine yourself if you traveled by air outside the United States in the last 14 days. Practice safe sanitation by carrying disinfectant wipes and, and all of the other protocols there. And, uh, and guys, if you're not feeling bad, don't come to the office, okay? Um, but your staff is back. We are back. And we are ready to serve you. Here's the deal. I'm going to just paraphrase. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. But here's the scoop. Um, all of the, almost all of the admin teams, uh, admin for the teams and groups are back in the office. And we are just so excited to have you back. Uh, however, some agents are here. Some are not. And I want you to know if there's no judgment on whether you come back in or not, don't come back in right now. It is, uh, everybody gets to make their individual uh, decisions on what to do. Now, we originally thought we were going to open the front door uh, this week to the public. And we were on a Zoom yesterday and realized that because we have an awful lot of property management activities going on, uh, that might bring in people, more people than we really want to have in the building at one time. So we are going to keep the door locked. However, there is a new notice on there that states if you're here to visit one of the agents, one of you, you can go ahead and call them and schedule time to come into the office. If it's someone that doesn't have an agent, they're going to reach out to the main office number and talk to either Sherry, myself, or Tiffany, and we will help them. Um, we are not doing any trainings in the training room as of yet. We will uh, probably not have anything the rest of this month, but now the month is getting to be uh, coming to an end. Can you believe it? So um, that's where we are right now. And I will post these instructions. Uh, they'll go out in an email and they'll also go out on our Facebook page. All right. Hey, does anybody, do you guys have any comments around any of that? I'd like to open it up for anybody listening. Unmute yourself if you do. Not a one, huh? I think wise decisions. Pardon? Wise decisions. Yeah. Which part? Well, I think that keep going ahead and keeping the do the door locked just a little bit longer, because there are there would be a lot of traffic. I think in and out. If we have clients coming to see us, just let them know. Call us when you when you arrive. Right. Right. Agreed. Any anyone else want to comment? All right. 
Let's move on. All right, I, here's what we did. I wanted to get a snapshot of what is happening in our market and in our office. And usually when we run the LORE report, the language of real estate, that's what the LORE stands for. These numbers, usually we're referring to the previous month. So for example, it would have been May 2020, and we would compare it against May 2019. Well, I wanted a little smaller view of what we're looking at. And this is where we are outpacing the market from April 2020 to May 2020, okay? Um, what's not on here, I think, are some really important numbers. Let me grab my lower report. Some numbers that we didn't post on here. Um, right now, where we are outpacing the market is in listing volume. Uh, closed volume, we're up, we're outpacing the market 13%. Contracts written, we're outpacing the market 3%. And contracts volume, we're outpacing the market 14%. Um, but right now, listings, just so you know, for the market itself, and you know this, all of you know this, there's a shortage of, a, a shortage of listings. And right now, uh, listings taken are down 13%. And um, the rest of the market closed units are down 11%. So you guys are still hanging in there. Um, and I'm, and I'm proud of you. You guys are really, really doing a great job. And I'm, and I'm hoping it's because you have uh, adjusted your business to the new normal and are continuing to keep in touch with your sphere. Okay. But those numbers are just what's happening with the little tiny snapshot of April to May. Any questions on that? Nope. Okay. Peggy. Hey, Peggy. Unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, I don't have a, a, a lot. We are going to, Terry and I are going to be talking about escalation clauses because we are in the multiple offer on everything situation uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock on a Zoom meeting. So I'm just going to encourage everyone to be on that. I'm going to try and get a couple of examples and some verbiage. I spoke with David Hall at the Real Estate Commission yesterday concerning um, escalation clauses. So we'll kind of be sharing that during our uh, Zoom meeting tomorrow at 11. And I'll have some examples together for you. They are legal in Oklahoma. And they had originally said that they were, they were not legal. And now they've kind of had a, a different stand on that until it gets voted on otherwise. So we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Did you want to respond to this little um, screenshot here? Can you see it, Peggy? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, um, I think <laughs> Tiffany <laughs> put something on there. I was like, um, she asked me what I wanted to share as a broker. Um, guys, just don't respond to things if you're feeling a little emotional at that time. That's gonna just be my, it's like mom slash broker advice because usually whatever your response is would not be how you would normally respond. So just take a pause on some things if it gets a little heightened and wait before you respond because that will eliminate the phone calls that I get later. So I would appreciate that. Got it. Good words. All right, so welcome new agents. We have one new agent, and I think she's on here, Dana King. We're so excited to have you, and welcome to Keller Williams. Um, when you, you probably won't see her right now, but uh, when you see her on a Zoom, you might say welcome and introduce yourself. Okay, so we're glad you're here, Dana. First listing, Austin Allen, woo! Congratulations, congratulations, Austin. First closing, Summer Fowler in the web group. Yay, Summer. Glad you're here. Um, the top five coming up this week, uh, I'm going to be doing the 411 at 11 o'clock today, people. I would, uh, it was Sarah Fleming on, I, what maybe it was her script. I can't remember what Zoom it was on. She said she's doing a 66 day challenge and her 66 day challenge is to look at her 411 every day. Oh, 
because I do a 411, but then it goes over here and it sits over there and I don't see it. Now, we talked about a, a little bit about um, some dialogue on a Facebook group yesterday saying your 411 is, is your success list. It's the things that you have to do. Now, I hope, I'm hoping that your 411 has enough of your vision of what you're trying to achieve uh, in there so that the activities that you're doing are going to take you to those goals and the bigger picture of what you're trying to achieve in your business. So anyway, jump on at 11 o'clock if you're interested. Uh, Missy is still leading up Mo Anderson's book club, The Joy-Filled Life. I don't know if any of you are on it, but it's pretty incredible. And uh, you can still join in. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 30 minutes from 12.15 to 12.45. Um, Mo is going to be making some appearances on that as well, so I highly recommend it. Crystal is going to be talking about door knocking on Wednesday. And then there's that all associate mastermind that Peggy mentioned on escalation clauses. Guys, guys, that is really great information. And I highly recommend uh, that being uh, sold out. Can you spell out on Zoom? Anyway, and then lastly, what in the world of real estate? It is our last one for the time being. So uh, join in Friday at 11 o'clock. And Sarah mentioned it on the What in the World of Real Estate last week. That was the Zoom where she was talking about her 66-day challenge being the fourth. Oh. And that's how she's trying to reacclimate to business, not just at home. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thanks for filling that in. I knew it was Sarah, and I couldn't remember where I'd seen it. So, okay, we went through that really, really fast because this is odd. It's not usual. I have never done this in a team meeting. However, it was highly encouraged, um, really encouraged uh, that we that we share this video during the team meeting. It's funny because I think when you open up your command, it might now be part of the playbook down below. It might be shown there, but uh, this was shared by Sherry Lewis at the region. And she reached out to all of the team leaders and said, you need to share this in the team meeting. So that's what we're doing. So what I'm going to do, we're going to show this video. It's about 36 minutes long. And then I'd like to, anybody that is still standing, and I hope you are because it's viable. Uh, anybody still standing, I would like to have just a little conversation around it at the end. I would love to hear your ahas. So if you have a pencil and paper, you know, write it through no, a few notes down. What this is, uh, Keith Cunningham is an author. And he is an incredible author. I just author. I just finished his book. Oh shoot, several months ago. But he wrote a book called *The Road Less Stupid*, and it was pretty awesome. I listened to it on Audible, and it was his voice, and you'll hear his voice. It was he was very engaging and entertaining. Um, and then he's also written. I think it's uh, he's. Ugh, I can't remember the other one. I haven't read yet, but it's on Gary Keller's top 100 list. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump onto the video. And, and the reason we're doing this is I know we get inundated with videos and, you know, it's, it's hard to know which ones we should be watching, which ones we should be listening to. I'm putting this one right out so we can watch it together as a group. So, it's Keys to the Vault. That's the other book that is really awesome. So, go ahead and get it started, Tiffany. Sit back. I wish I had popcorn, but enjoy. Uh-oh. Hmm. Tiff, let's try. Can you not hear it? No. Nope. We can hear it. <laughs> Hold oh, on. you all can, you got, can you hear it, Kara? Yeah. No? No, anybody else, can they, you hear it? No, I can't hear it either. Okay. It's good to see you this morning. You look good. There we go. I'd love for you just to tell us just a second about yourself. So I've been in Austin 51 years. Uh, I'm not 51 years old, which means uh, I came actually, I, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. Uh, I came to school here in 1968 and uh, stayed. Um, 
I'm a business guy. I now you own, went to UT. You went to UT and you got an MBA in accounting, right? I, I just, did. I, I got an MBA. I got a degree in accounting, MBA in finance, and. Uh, Tiff, you have to un you have to keep your thing unmuted, otherwise we can't hear it. And then it, it didn't last long enough, and then it got really ugly. Yeah. So um, so over the years, I've bought it and sold and financed and turned around and owned businesses. And at this point, I spend the majority of my time in the teaching world. Uh, I write books and and teach business owners business skills and tools. I help business people make the transition from operator to owner. Yes. Well, I the um, to the vault uh, is a book that in my masterminds annually I recommend to everybody. So a lot of people on this call will be familiar with that book. And in the, your most recent book. A stupid person must read is a must read. So first, I just want to say thank you for all you do. You've been a place of reason uh, and insight uh, around running a business for so long uh, that, in my mind, you're probably one of the most significant voices of our time. So thank you for that. So let's just talk. We're in a crisis, and uh, you've, uh, as you always are, you you have been quick. To draw your observations and share those. So when you're in a crisis, so let's just take this time period to talk about this. So in a crisis, how am I supposed to think? What 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 what? what give me the 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 just overview of your thoughts. Uh, I'm in a crisis. So so probably thought number one is that uh, this requirement in a crisis to shift priorities. They're very growth oriented. Uh, they are opportunistic. Uh, for most people in most crises, the, the idea has to shift from being strategic to being tactical. In a crisis, priorities are number one, survive. And number two, the old new shoot is still low. Requires cash. Yeah, uh, my neighbor out of oxygen. Ew, yeah. Tim, do you know what that is? Then we realize it was a fab. So are you just going to burn it? Everyone get their computer so we can hear the video, please. Simultaneous. <laughs> Don't run out of cash. And okay, is, let me get the amount of cash in the main end. I'm always getting the suitcase. We know where you're at. Some sort of cut. Hey, hey, gang, can everybody please mute yourself? A couple years ago, 2017, there was a, a, a junior varsity soccer coach in Thailand that took his 12 teenage kids, his, his, his players, on a hiking expedition into some caves and just, just outside of, of the main city in Thailand. And while the, right before they left to go on this afternoon hike, they stopped at a convenience store and picked up some snacks. The snacks they picked up was the equivalent of four peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So they get into the cave, it starts to rain, the rain that causes the water level to rise, it blocks the entrances and the exits. Everybody was following this uh, worldwide on the news. And, and they were in the cave 12 days before they were discovered and 18 days before they were actually rescued. The, the rescue effort was huge. There were 10,000 people involved, 700 divers, 2,000 soldiers. So it was a major expedition and most people remember it. Here's the remarkable part of the story. 
At the end of 18 days, these 12 teenage boys still had one and a half peanut butter and jelly sandwiches left. So the moral of the story is, if you don't know how long a crisis is going to last, you better make sure you can stretch what you do have That's as right. long as possible. I'll say that a different way. I'll put it on a bumper sticker. Current expenses consume, consume future oxygen. Current expenses consume future oxygen. And I think the mistake that people make when there's a crisis, and this crisis is unlike any crisis we've ever had before. That's right. And the reason is because it's just not, it's not just an economic crisis. It's going to be a how you actually do business crisis. That's right. It's not going to, it's not going to just bounce back to the way it used to look. And it's not. so how, how you do what you do makes this one unique. And, and my experience is Gary, that most people are too optimistic about either the length of the recovery or what it's going to look like post recovery they're hopeful aren't they they're, they yeah. they 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 they're not using reasoning they're not they're not actually looking at the situation they're more hopeful than honest i look i, I what you just said about about being honest with the situation i think is critical uh, a, a great example might be the titanic the original plan of every passenger on the Titanic was to get from England to the United States, and that plan radically changed the instant they hit the iceberg. And after the iceberg, there wasn't one person on the Titanic who was thinking about what they were going to have for dinner or what dress they were going to wear to the gala once they got to New York. So the change in priorities was dramatic because of the radical change in circumstances. And what I'm seeing over and over again is there's a lot of people that are cursing the iceberg or they're screaming at the captain of the ship. Uh, and, and the reality is neither one of those stop the boat from sinking or ensure your safety and survival. So this wishful, hope, hopeful thinking, relying on the law of attraction is insane. Uh, only, only mentally unstable people walk out of their front door in the middle of a Cat 5 hurricane and curse the wind. So the key is you gotta, you gotta face reality and play the hand you've been dealt if you expect to survive. What mistakes do you think that people make right now? What are, what are the one or two mistakes that you just see that uh, uh, people make? You know what, I think, I think there's a mistake of business as usual. Uh, so, so maybe an example on this would be uh, 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 an emergency room in a hospital. If you think about an emergency room in a hospital, there's huge amounts of level of intensity there is a sense of urgency, a high degree of flexibility in, in terms of how people are uh, uh, approaching the problem. Um, there is precise execution. Uh, speed is your friend. There's constant, mon in, a, in an emergency room, there's constant monitoring of vital signs. So think about an emergency room. In an emergency room, there is, nobody's monitoring your BMI or your cholesterol. And the reason is because that stuff doesn't kill you. In, in, a, in an emergency room, it, they're monitoring the vital signs. And the vital signs are things like cash and cash flow and aligning expenses and cash coming in and revenue, all of that kind of stuff is the stuff that, that causes businesses to survive. And, and look, a lot of businesses had an underlying uh, financial health condition before this whole crisis started. So they're, they're more at risk than people who entered into this crisis healthy. It doesn't mean you can't get sick, but your odds of dying go down if you 
ran your business. Somebody told me years ago, they said, Keith, how you run your business during the good times dictates how well you'll survive the bad times. That's exactly right. And I think there's a lot of people that ran their businesses a little sloppy. They got out over the tips of their skis. They were a little chubby. They were out of shape financially. They, they've taken on a little bit too much debt trying to get lucky. Uh, their, their expenses weren't tight. And so as a result, now all of a sudden there's a, a meteor that hit Earth. That's the way I, I view this. It's like a, 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 an asteroid hit Earth and all of a sudden there's this giant unexpected problem. It, it doesn't, look, it doesn't mean there isn't a problem. It just means that if business as usual is not the solution. Yeah, people thought they had time. One of the things I observe over and over again is people, um, they, they project out that I've got plenty of time and um, this exposes that, doesn't it? <clears throat> you never know how much time you have. I think that's right. I think that's, look, a lot of people were aware that we were towards the end of one of the longest bull markets in history that the economy had done well, that that the, the politics were aligned around supporting business. And I think people thought they had kind of until the end of the year to figure out yeah. you know, their finances. And and the reality is they, they weren't prepared for a sudden jolt to the system. And it's a lesson, candidly, that I had to learn the hard way 30 years ago when, it, when you and I both remember the 1980s and, oh. and, and all of the drama around that. And I learned then that, that creating wealth is typically a slow and plodding kind of exercise. Losing money can happen in a heartbeat. But, but what it takes to actually create money requires and create wealth is is figuring out how to make it how to make it sustainable uh, you know i tell people all the time look i don't want to be rich for a day i don't want to be in a great relationship for a week uh, what's required is how do i need to think about this so that it's sustainable and i'm not yo-yoing back and forth between rich and poor well that's right the the thing that i constantly preach is, is that there's two types of people those who get where they are and those that don't and those that don't get where they are um, end up playing one game, and those that get where they are <clears throat> play a, an entirely different. You know, they 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 understand it. They they realize uh, something is happening that they can't control, but they can absolutely do whatever they can. Let me ask you a question. Um, talk to me about people for just a second, Keith. Um, how should I be thinking about the people? that might be working in my business right now? Well, uh, it depends, uh, as you, you might expect that answer. Um, from, from most of us, our people are our greatest asset. Our people sometimes are also our greatest anchor. I, I ask the question frequently to business owners, how many of your current problems would go away if 100% of your team was A players. And what most people tell me is the bulk of their problems go away if they've got all A players. Um, I think in a crisis, the, the critical thing to do is to cut the fat, muscle if you need to, but avoid cutting the bone. Uh, the, if you cut the bone, you're going to limp for a long, long time. And the bone to me is who are the people that are going to be required to restart the engine. So the, the people, the, the bone is not necessarily the race car driver, although they're the ones that get all the headlines. The bone is the people that can actually build the engine and start the engine once this is over. So I, I think that, 
that for a lot of business owners, making the decision around people that, that remain with the business or get furloughed uh, or, or temporarily laid off or permanently laid off. I, I think it's an opportunity to relook at the business. I'm gonna give you a thought. I, I think everybody that's listening to me right now needs to do three audits of their business. Audit number one is an audit of expenses. What, so, so this is the log of lessons learned kind of opportunity. Where have the expenses gotten too chubby uh, because you were in a growth and opportunistic mode prior to this crisis, or you would just gotten a little fat? Uh, you, the, you gained some weight and you, know, you weren't in tip top shape and now there's a crisis and there's problems. So I think there's an, an opportunity to audit expenses. I think the second opportunity is to audit, audit the processes. How, how we, do, uh, so it's an efficiency audit. How we do what we do. And is how we, and you were talking about this a second ago, ago, Gary, when you talked about doing some of the blending with Zooms and digital open houses and that kind of stuff. It's how do we do what we do to, 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 so that it requires less time, fewer resources. We make fewer mistakes. So there's an efficiency audit that's available to us. And then finally, uh, there is a capacity audit. Excess capacity is a killer in a crisis. So excess capacity typically builds up because during normal times, we're focused on saying yes, we're focused on growth, we're focused on being opportunistic. And so our organizations tend to get a little obese. There's an opportunity during a, a crisis to shed the excess capacity and get back to the core activities that actually make most of us, most of our money. And these three audits are, are fall under a heading of reinvention. It, where's the opportunity to reinvent your business as a result of the crisis? Some of that reinvention is gonna be voluntary and some of that reinvention is gonna be forced on you by the market or by your competition. And I think, I think only crazy people come through, a, well, number one, crazy people try to run their businesses the same during a crisis as they do normal times. That's nutty. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, crazy people say when there's this kind of crisis, that, that, that's gonna change how we do what we do. I, you know, I'll ask you the same question I ask other people. How long is it gonna be before you go sit 15 inches away from some from a total stranger in a movie theater? Yeah, it's tough. It, it, it's gonna be a while. Now it's gonna happen, but it's gonna be a while. That's right. And we're gonna have all kinds of precautions. So oftentimes the reinvention is forced on us, but but I think I think if we models, would, models are going to change. Models are going to change. Models are going to change. They're going to change. And, 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 and in normal recessions, norm, <laughs> listen to what I just said, normal recession, ha ha, uh, Freudian slip. Yeah, in a, in a recession that is not of this making, um, <clears throat> business models also shift. But what you referred to a second ago, uh, the movie theater is a perfect example, and that is, we will not go back anytime soon to 100% of the way we did business. That's, a, that's an absolute given. Take it to the bank. That's the way it's going to be. Do we know what it's going to be like? We don't. We don't know how they're going to solve the movie theater issue or the spa issue or the hotel issue, right? The grocery store, they're still trying to solve the grocery store issue, right? Um, we don't know how they're going to do it. We do know that people are amazingly creative, right, Keith? They are going to figure this out. They're not going to just sit there and not figure it out. But when I look at the real estate industry, we have been begging, begging the industry and all the different parts to come together and play as one to streamline the transaction. This is just an example. And because they haven't had to do it, 
And because they had five those teeth, they didn't do it. Now, all of a sudden, for the first time in, in the history that I'm aware of, all those players are coming together because they realize if they don't streamline this and figure out how to do this digitally or virtually or in some way distanced, um, they're not going to be a business at all. So for the first time, really, bam, just like that in a month, they're all talking Right. And this has been this has been a conversation for going on 15 years and they have not made amazing progress. And I will promise you in the last five weeks, they've made amazing progress <clears throat> and it's going to change. It, it's it's, it's, it's going to the industry will never look the same. I don't know what it's going to look like totally, but I do know this. The spoils go to the individuals who think about it who try to come up with answers and begin to experiment with those answers before anybody else. I agree. I agree. I think there's a huge opportunity. I think it's fraught with landmines. I think it's, I don't think anybody has the answer, but I think if you'll face the reality of what the market is and adjust to the market, this is, this is one of the great fundamental uh, foundation blocks of building a business. The, the foundation block is figure out what the market is and adapt to that. And trying to change the market and what they want is really, really difficult. Uh, and it's expensive. That's right. I think if, if we would simply say, what is the market? What do they want? How, what needs to happen for the market to feel comfortable? What has to happen for the market to, um, to, to uh, be reassured? And then design our businesses so that we meet the market where they are, as opposed to us figuring out what we want to give them. Let's figure out what they want and then get it and give it to them. You know, what's interesting is, is that in our industry, <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, resistance to using technology and exploring technology to its fullest has continued to amaze me a little bit, um, I, right? Until I remember that they resisted going from the MLS book to the computer, right? Uh, the, um, but all of a sudden, you really don't have a choice, do you? Those firms that invested in technology, those real estate agents who spent the time and got their business on an operating platform that allowed them to maximize their service opportunities, their value opportunities, their financial opportunities are the ones that are going to win. They're going to win big because look what you and I are doing today. Normally, you and I'd be sitting in a room in some really comfortable high chairs talking. And instead, we're sitting in comfortable, I bet you have a cushion under yours, by the way, cushion chairs, right? And we're, we're on a, a digital platform having this conversation. It's, any thoughts about that? Yeah, look, I, 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 it's, a, it's a form of leverage. Uh, and and oftentimes we're reluctant to migrate to higher leverage opportunities because it doesn't look or sound or smell like the way we used to do it. Uh, our what sabotages reinvention is an attachment to the way it used to look, and the sooner that you can uh, uh, let go of this idea of it used to look this way. Well, of course it looked that way because that's what the market wanted. That's the way the market wanted it to look. Yeah, we, we built our businesses in, in order to serve the market and the market used to look one way and today it looks another. That's right. And the people that are going to get left behind are the people that don't make that transition to that this is the new way it looks. I'm going to give you a great example. Uh, you're not going to like the example. Nobody likes this example, but nevertheless, it's true. There's only one reason, only one reason Kobe Bryant is dead. 
And the reason is that when it got foggy and visibility went to zero, the helicopter pilot kept flying. That's the only reason he's dead. That's right. It, 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 the, the helicopter That's right. pilot, who's a good guy, did not have dials in the cockpit. So when times are great, we can look out the window of our helicopter, kind of right. see where the road and the river intersect, and, and we can make the turn. But when it gets foggy and, and visibility, and you don't have any dials in your cockpit, and you decide incredibly stupidly, when it's foggy, you decide you're going to keep flying and you can't see. Have you lost your mind? No wonder everybody died. They hit a mountain. And so here's the key. I, I, this is another one of these shifts. This is a business shift. If you've historically been flying your business by looking out the window and kind of measuring generally with foggy, kind of fluffy gut feel, the market is good, I'll be okay. And now all of a sudden the it's foggy and visibility is low. And if you don't have dials to help you monitor how you're doing, dials on cash, dials on cash flow, specific metrics on you know number of showings or whatever all that is for your business, if you don't have those kind of dials, I promise you, you will die. Because it's simply too foggy and you can't see. Therefore, it's an opportunity to change how you do what you do. That's exactly right. The the what people haven't understood <clears throat> about technology is this is as this is as bad as it gets and as least as it gets. The the truth of the matter is is that being a digitally based and physically enhanced business is the way the entire world is going. And what's interesting to me is what's happened to us right now is everyone no matter who you are, is being forced to address that very issue. Before that, they thought they had a choice because the world was still physically based in wrestling with how they made a transition. The companies that were digitally started as digital, they don't have that problem, right? They imagine the world as you wake up in the morning and you start with a digital experience and you enhance it with a physical interaction or physical experience, right? The malls are a great example. They started and ended on a, on a physical concept. And then they got upended by someone who imagined that there would be a digital first, physical second. Amazon, by the way, now owns Whole Foods. Amazon has bookstores. Amazon has uh, quickie markets that you can go get stuff. They, did, they have learned, by the way, that they maxed out digitally. They maxed out. They they are they were struggling to grow, and they understood there needed to be a physical component. But the physical based individual is now being forced to deal with that, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Uh, the The environment has changed, and our job as business owners is to meet the market where it is. And and, and if the That's market right. is different as a result of the asteroid that's hit, then, that's right. then let's change how we do what we do. Let's change how we engage with, with our customers. People still want homes. People are still gonna move. People are still gonna change jobs and, and upsides and downsides and, and everything in between. They want a that's different right. school. It's still gonna happen. Absolutely. It's just gonna happen differently. And, exactly. and there's gonna be people that make that transition and there's gonna be other people they get stuck and where they are and and the way it used to look and are going to be unable to make the transition. I'll tell you this though, uh, from a from a purely economic point of view, and and this is probably from a business point of view as well. And you may disagree with this, Gary. In my opinion, the greatest risk that we face today is not the current quarantine it's that this quarantine has happened and it is probably going to be the protocol of the future for future kinds of of issues that 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 
that where the government or somebody says, ooh, there's, there's a, 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 a bug out there, there's a disease, and the protocol needs to be, let's shut this thing down for 30 or 60 or 90 days. And, and if that becomes the, the go-to response, then the key for us as business owners is how do we build a business? How do we build a machine that can withstand these kinds of future asteroids? Well, no, I don't disagree with that at all. In fact, I'm nodding my head going, amen, absolutely. Um, there is, um, we will think about how we did business in February as the good old days. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will, we will all refer to that as the good old days because out of nowhere a meteor hit us and we will never be the same it will be now digitally based and physically enhanced yeah. it just will be that's just the way it's going to be and we are going to be these things are going to happen with more regular occurrence and we're going to have to understand that they're going to come without warning they're going to come without sirens and our businesses have to be run in a way our lives, our careers have to be running away that, that, that we are now prepared for that, right? I think that's it. There's a great story. There's a great story about Lee Iacocca, who yeah. many of the people on your call have never heard of. Back in the day when I was young and in business, uh, he was one of the oh, yeah. uh, American business studs. I mean, this oh, guy absolutely. was absolutely. True genius. He was. So in, in 1979, Lee Iacocca took over as CEO of Chrysler, which he had been the number two guy at Ford and gotten fired. And so he took over as number one guy of Chrysler in 1979. And Chrysler was in the process of failing. And it would needed to raise some money to be able to stay alive. And Wall Street had turned them down. Nobody would loan Chrysler any money. So Lee Iacocca said, well, there's only one, there's only one organization with this much money that would loan it to us, and that's the United States federal government. So Lee gets on a plane and flies to Washington, D.C., and meets with 12 congressmen, and he lays out the problem. And he says, look, if you guys will loan us $1 billion, I think we'll make it. And, and Congress said, Lee, that has never happened. The United States federal government does not bail out private companies. And Lee looked at him and said, look, you're going to write a check. To bail us out is $1 billion. If you don't bail us out, we're going to go broke and 475,000 people are going to hit unemployment. And the first year, the first year, you're going to write a check for $2 billion if we go broke. So you're going to write a check, and I'd suggest the check you write be the check to bail us out. So in 1979, for the first time, the United States federal government bailed out a privately held company. All right, now, Gary, in the last 35, 40 years, how many privately held companies have the United States bailed out? It's in the thousands because we broke that ceiling, that glass ceiling was broken. And the problem going forward is that now that, that our, uh, our way of doing things is to put in place a quarantine that shuts down the entire economy, if that's now the, the way to handle this, rest assured, this will not be the last time. And so I think the machine we need to build, and it goes to exactly what you were talking about, and really what you've been working on for the last several years, which is, look, people are still going to buy and sell houses. They're still going to rent apartments. They're still going to move. But the old way of doing it That's right. is, is not going to be the, the way to do it in the future. Right. And so we need to migrate how we do what we do in order to serve the market and the key to this is if you as as a business owner don't build a business that can withstand future asteroids this is going to be an exceptionally painful career 
That's right. Because more asteroids are coming. They will hit Earth again. We're, this is not the only time we're going to be locked down in our lifetimes. That's right. Well, the interesting you know, thing is... Let's build a machine. Yeah, that's a good note to stop on. You know, the, the thing is, is that we know recessions come regularly. We, we know that. Um, now, what's going to come in addition to that is it's going to be climate and it's going to be uh, disease. And we know they're coming. To not acknowledge that and not behave in a manner as a business person or a professional, knowing that is insane. So I have one last question for you before we go. Why'd you shave your mustache off? <laughs> okay, so I grew my mustache when I was 22 years old. Yeah, me and too. Be because I wanted to look older, I was I was 22 and running a pretty good sized company, and 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 by the time I was 28 or 29, I had a, a a very large company that I was running, and I looked like a kid. So. So I kept the mustache for 25 years, and sure enough, by then I was older and wanted to look a little younger, so I shaved the mustache, and that's been 20 years ago. So, okay, so what are you telling me? Is this is some sort of subliminal message? There's nothing subliminal about it. If you shave your mustache, you would look younger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend, it's good seeing you. Even though it's digital, I still love you, and I care about you. I love grateful. you, too. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Okay. How about unmuting? And let's talk just a few minutes. We've got just about three or four, maybe five minutes. What do you think? Anybody? We were discussing the fact that we, I mean, we have audited our expenses and, and we run, um, pretty lean on that but our processes and our efficiencies definitely need some revisiting there you go yeah right good one what else we're we're focusing on standards and i i loved what he said about um you know if you don't shift and pivot and change the way you do your business you're not going to make it yeah. you can't continue to do what you were doing and expect it to work so just being aware and understanding that you're going to have to change the way you do some things if you're going to make it. Right. Right. And I think that was true for anyone that was around in the 2006, 2007 era for those of you that are on the call, because we saw that, you know, the real estate agents that didn't have the ability to change the way they did their business are not in the business anymore. Right. 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 They're gone. Yeah. We'll probably see some of that here too. Mm -hmm. Probably isn't even a good word. I'm, I'm sugarcoating. There will be people that'll leave the business because of this. Well, if you think about, you know, just lessons learned in 2008, 14,000 real estate agents in Oklahoma went down to about 8,500. So you right. had a lot of people that they just simply didn't know how to pivot or change their business. So they didn't and um, ended up doing whatever it is that people do after real estate. Right, right. The good news is you guys are with a real estate company that, oh my Lord, they're giving you content every day. And again, we don't need, like Gary Keller says, we don't know what this market is going to look like. We, we don't know where it's going, when all is going to stop, what it's going to, what's going to look like. But you've got a lot of people that are risk takers out on the front lines making adjustments right now. And you know, they're saying, I'm going to adjust as I need to. I'll adjust as I need to as, as we continue to go. Just like Keith was saying there, he was saying there's going to be landmines, and there will be. So, what else? I like that he was saying to kind of like expect this again. You know what I mean? Like prepare for it now, expect it to happen again, because I do think we will probably see this happen again and again and again. And if we're prepared and have those systems together, it's going to be so easy to transition in and out of that. Right. Jalen um, is in the training with me and she said that what struck her was his conversations around paying attention to your audience and then moving yourself to meet the needs of that audience instead of trying to manipulate the audience to meet your needs. Mm-hmm. 
the consumer is always going to drive this. Contrary to what people may think, the consumer is going to drive it. True. What else? I myself am all about the one-liners. Wait, are you talking? Your, your sound isn't on. <laughs> Come say it in here. <laughs> <laughs> Is Sherry? Do you want to go in there? Okay. Uh, I was saying, um, when he was talking about the expenses, trim your fat muscle if you have to, but never cut your bone or your lymph for a long time. Yeah. I think that was kind of important because, uh, well, I think it, it applies across the board. It applies in your expenses, but it also applies in all of the different aspects of your business and what you're doing. So, you know, if you have um, customers who are repeat after repeat after repeat or investors who work with you frequently, you want to make sure that you're your um, playing playing towards their needs because they're the bone of your of your customers. So you want to make sure that you're still giving them a little extra love and attention during the times when they themselves might be struggling because once they get back on their feet, that's still the bone of your business. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of nice because it applied to expenses, but it also applied to like your your database or your your structure within your business. You know, on that note, he was also talking about that that capacity, about auditing your capacity, which, um, you know, sometimes he was talk he was talking about if you're obese, meaning you've got I, I hate to say it, but it's a people probably a people issue. Gary Keller's been talking about it that this is the time that you need to take a look at everybody on your team and see are they a players. So if they're not, you either get them to a player or you might need to find another player. Because right now it's, it's the best of the best. So, you know, anybody born, if you're brand new and we've got some new people on this, if you're brand new, I'm going to tell you, you've got an advantage right now because being born in being born in a shift, being born, meaning you're becoming a real estate agent during a shift, you're going to learn foundational things that you implement now because you have to, you will not have another choice. You won't be able to sit back waiting for your phone to ring. And uh, you, you've got to, you've got to um, you know, jump in and do the work and those activities become habits and the habits are gonna create some really awesome results. So, so you know, for those of you that got into the business back in 2006, seven, eight, even five, six, seven, eight, you were forced, we were, we were forced to have better processes, better systems uh, to do things a little bit more, um, you know, driven by various models in order to be successful. And, you know, the, for those that are new, when you follow those, your chances for success long-term are even better. So, all right, gang, team meeting comes in. Anybody else want to say one more, anything else? All right, good to see you guys. We're still gonna be doing this. I have no idea when we're going to move into our training room. So uh, just keep looking on our Facebook group for what we have coming up to support you over the next weeks, okay? All right, take care, bye.